This year has seen a teacher strike in West Virginia, which led to the teachers in that state getting a raise for the important work they do. But that strike wasn't the first time that protests have come to the public schools of the Mountaineer State. Back in the 1970s, protests and violence came to Kanawha County over the school board's choice of textbooks for the students. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins. You're listening to Stories, a history of Appalachia. You know, Steve, I wouldn't want to be entrusted into putting together a textbook for students because you have to be able to bring all of these different elements together. And then once they're brought together, they are quickly so judged on what the content of it is and what the meaning of why you put that in the textbook to begin with. It's it's a very touchy subject being able to put these textbooks together. We are so divided politically nowadays that, you know, that would not be a job I'd want to to have to do. But Mm -hmm. the interesting thing about this is all this political division we've got now, part of the roots of it are in this particular story back in 1974 and 75. Now, let's hear it. This sounds like it's going to be another interesting story. All right. Well, let's go back to the spring of 1974, where the English Language Textbook Committee of Kanawha County, West Virginia, met, as they did every year, to recommend county school books for the following school year. The committee recommended 325 books to the school board. These recommendations came after West Virginia mandated a new state curriculum that included the concepts of multiculturalism and egalitarianism in the writing of school books. Now, most of the school board members were okay with the new textbooks, except for one, Alice Moore. As Ms. Moore looked deeper into the new books, she found several things that caused her some concerns, didn't she, Rod? Yes, she did. And this is almost like I'm 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 hearing Jeannie C. Riley and Harper Valley PTA to a certain <laughs> degree in my head. But no. First of all was the inclusion of the term dialectology, which refers to the teaching of dialects as equal to standard English, particularly Appalachian English and African American English. Now, myself, I don't see a problem with that. And Miss Moore disagreed with that position, arguing that for West Virginians to be able to get access to higher education and careers, they would have to adopt standard English or be labeled illiterate. But that was only the beginning, as Alice Moore, incidentally the wife of a fundamentalist preacher, read the new books more closely, and she found some passages that struck a nerve. In one book, for example, there was a quote from the autobiography of Malcolm X, in which he referred to Christians as being brainwashed. She also found quotes from beat poet Allen Ginsberg, Sigmund Freud, we all know about Sigmund Freud, in which the Oedipus complex was described. I'm sure she did not know that Oedipus Rex was being taught in school. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> and Black Panthers, Eldridge Cleaver and George Jackson, that she found offensive and anti-Christian. That's when Ms. Moore took action. She got in touch with a textbook evaluator from a Christian nonprofit group in Texas, one Mel Gabler, to evaluate the new books for anti-Christian bias. He sent to her his analysis of the books and how they conflicted with Christian values, morality, and patriotism. Mrs. Moore then reported her concerns to the board and to the local media. And on May 23rd, she came to the school board meeting and unloaded on the board, charging that the books were... Filthy, disgusting, trash, unpatriotic, and unduly favoring blacks. In her opinion, these new textbooks were teaching kids to disrespect their elders and teaching relativism instead of absolute right or wrong. She was passionate in her opposition to the books and won over the local PTA. However, the West Virginia Council of Churches were much less impressed, and they ended up supporting the new curriculum. Well, on June 27th, the school board met and voted on adopting the new books. Under the eyes of 1,000 local residents and after a three-hour debate, the board approved the curriculum by a three-to-two vote, which set off a conservative firestorm. A local minister, Reverend Marvin Horan, called for a boycott of the Kanawha County Public Schools until these monstrous books were removed from the classroom. Then flyers began appearing around the area claiming that these textbooks were not only liberal, but were lewd as well. The flyers purported to quote dirty passages from the books, but it turned out that these quotes came from books 
not on the curriculum. So that should have settled things, right? Well, no, because when the parents couldn't find the offending passages in their kids' books, they accused the teachers of hiding the real books so they couldn't see what their children were really being taught. At this point, things ramped up quickly. In August, 9,000 out of the 45,000 Kanawha County public school students were kept out of school as part of the boycott or in fear for their safety. Not only students, but bus drivers and trucking workers joined in. By the first week of September, local miners also joined the boycott, staging a wildcat strike in support of removing those books from the classroom. These strikes shut down mines in West Virginia and Kentucky, and the miners used their experience in organizing shutdowns to take control of picket lines at the schools and escalating the protests to another level. Now, with all this passion flying around, the school superintendent, Kenneth Underwood, decided it might be a good idea to just, you know, shut down the schools till things cooled down. On September 12th, the school board removed the offending books temporarily, appointing a committee of 18 local citizens to review each book. But that didn't help either, and the protest not only continued, but got even more heated. Well, at George Washington High School, 1,200 students walked out in protest over what they say was censorship, demanding that the new books be put back in the schools, vowing not to return to classes until that was done. This effectively shut down George Washington High School. Then it happened. In October, some of the more radical fringe of the anti-textbook protesters decided that the schools would have to be shut down by force in order to get those filthy, liberal books out of the classroom. So they did, by vandalizing several schools with dynamite and Molotov cocktails. And they also placed 15 sticks of dynamite near a gas meter at the Board of Education offices, which exploded shortly after the board meeting had adjourned. For all the blasts, no one was injured or killed in these incidents. But not only that, the homes of the kids who remained in school were stoned. Things got so bad that Alice Moore herself fled town for a time to escape the back-and-forth violence. I'm going to tell you something, Steve. In West Virginia, when they have strikes, they don't do them on a small scale. Oh, they don't fool around. Well, a pastor, the Reverend Charles Quigley, even asked Christians to, quote, pray that God will kill the giants who have mocked and made fun of dumb fundamentalists, end quote prompting one student to remark on the irony of protesters bombing and shooting at people because they don't want to see violence in books. A good point. On November 8th, there was a school board meeting set at the Charleston Civic Center to make room for all the thousands of people who wanted to attend. That turned into a bust, though, because only about 100 people showed up due to concerns over possible violence. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't want to be bombed either, to be quite honest Uh, with you. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. At this meeting, the board put the books back into the schools by a vote of three to two. Some of the more controversial books were put in the library, though, and a signed parental permission slip was required before a student could check it out. In the spring of 1975, Reverend Marvin Horan was arrested and tried for the bombings of the schools. In April, he was found guilty and sentenced to three years in prison, bringing an end to the protests. That fall, the Kanawha County School Board restored all the books that they had approved a year and a half earlier. The importance of this protest is that it was the first shot in the culture wars that still dominate American politics to this day. And I think it's almost, uh, it's hard to fathom to a certain degree that you would have a reverend, a pastor, that would go and be involved in bombings like this. But like I said, In West Virginia, they don't do anything on a small scale. And something like this, this was stepping on toes back in that time, especially in the 70s. And we were kind of still involved in, I guess, uh, the leftovers of the 60s and the flower movement and all the different things that happened uh, from Vietnam on, Steve. Well, this, to be honest with you, is the first time that the right got up and got the guts to make themselves heard and make themselves known and... They liked it, and it went on from there through the Reagan years, through the Bush years, the Clinton years, on up to today with the Trump years. So Mm -hmm. that's where all this started, but that's the first shot in the culture wars right here in Appalachia. Wow. 
And that's the story of the Kanawha County School Textbook Protests, another story that makes up the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Now, folks, we have a favor to ask of you. Stories is now available not only on Stitcher and Apple Podcasts, but on a brand new app called Radio Public. Now, if you download the app for your phone from the iTunes Store or the Google Store, then listen to stories on it, we get a share of revenue, which will help us be able to keep bringing you more of the history of Appalachia. Radio Public also has many of your other favorite podcasts, too, and you'll be helping them out as well. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Till next time, y'all take care. So long, everybody. Mm-hmm.